tonight. Do not worry. I will be fine for telling the truth. The impeachment hearings. Day three features the first witnesses who listened to President Trump's phone call at the center of the impeachment inquiry. We break down the day's highlights and why they matter. Plus, race matters solutions. As hate crimes rise across the country, teachers develop tools necessary to stop white nationalists from recruiting their students. We're talking about young people who don't yet have fully formed views and opinions about the world, and that's a big reason why white nationalists and alt-right groups are working to recruit them. All that and more on tonight's PBS NewsHour. Major funding for the PBS NewsHour has been provided by... Consumer Cellular offers no-contract wireless plans that are designed to help you do more of the things you enjoy. Whether you're a talker, texter, browser, photographer, or a bit of everything, our U.S.-based customer service team is here to find a plan that fits you. To learn more, go to ConsumerCellular.tv. BNSF Railway. And with the ongoing support of these institutions. This program was made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. The third day of public impeachment hearings brings four witnesses before the U.S. House Intelligence Committee. For the first time, we hear testimony from individuals on the call between President Trump and Ukraine's leader at the center of the inquiry. Again, we see criticism of the witness as they testify, this time from the official White House Twitter account. There is a lot to unpack. And here to break it down and look at the highlights and why they matter are Lisa Desjardins. She's at the Capitol and was in the hearing room today. Yamiche Alcindor is at the White House. And Nick Schifrin is with me at the table now. Lisa, I want to turn to you first because those first witnesses we heard from today were both on that call in July between President Trump and President Zelensky. It prompted the whistleblower's report in the first place. Let's just take a quick listen to what those witnesses Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Vindman and Jennifer Williams had to say about that call. I was concerned by the call. What I heard was inappropriate, and I reported my concerns to Mr. Eisenberg. It is improper for the President of the United States to demand a foreign government investigate a U.S. citizen and a political opponent. I was also clear that if Ukraine pursued an investigation, it was also clear that if Ukraine pursued an investigation into the 2016 elections, the Bidens and Burisma, it would be interpreted as a partisan play. This would undoubtedly result in Ukraine losing bipartisan support, undermining U.S. national security, and advancing Russia's strategic objectives in the region. I want to emphasize to the committee that when I reported my concerns on July 10th relating to Ambassador Sondland, and then July 25th relating to the President, I did so out of a sense of duty. Approximately how many calls between a president, the a president of the United States and foreign leaders had you listened to? I would say roughly a dozen. Had you ever heard a call like this? As I testified before, I, I believe what I found un, uh, unusual or different about this call was the president's reference to specific investigations. And uh, that struck me as different than other calls I had listened to. You testified that you thought it was political in nature. What did, why did you think that? I thought that the references to specific individuals and investigations, such as former Vice President Biden and his son, struck me as political in nature, given that the former Vice President is a political opponent of the President. Lisa, you were in the hearing room while those moments unfolded. We should also mention Lieutenant Colonel Vindman is on the National Security Council staff. Jennifer Williams is an aide to Vice President Pence. These both of these witnesses, Lisa, were called by Democrats. Why? What's the case Democrats are making there? Today, Democrats are trying to focus on what they see as the central piece of evidence here, Omna, the phone call from President Trump to President Zelensky of the Ukraine in July. And here they have the first two people we've heard from publicly who listened in on that call in real time. And what's more, Democrats' point here is both of these officials 
who are not politically appointed had immediate concerns. Democrats also have raised today throughout the hearings with Lieutenant Colonel Vindman and with another witness, Tim Morrison, that we'll talk about more later, uh, that those individuals raised their concerns up the chain very quickly, that they felt they were so serious. And Omna, another really important part of that sound that you just played, Jennifer Williams' conclusion that this was political because it's not just about the president asking for investigations, it's about his motivations. And there you have an, a professional staffer who herself is trying not to be political say that she felt when the Bidens were mentioned it was political because it was an opponent of the president. That is the core of the case that Democrats are trying to make for impeachment. And today they were trying to connect those dots and make it real with the officials who heard it as it happened. And that brings us to Yamish over at the White House. Yamish, both of those witnesses testified they had concerns about the president's behavior on that call. What does this mean for the White House? Well, this is problematic for the White House because before today, Republicans and the president were making the case that these were not people coming before Congress that were actually on the call that had concerns. Today, change that. These were people who had heard President Trump on the on phone calls with other <laughs> foreign leaders and felt that the July 25th phone call between him and the president of Ukraine was unusual and improper. The other also thing that's problematic is that the White House has basically had the stance that no one should come before Congress. Instead, you have these two people who currently still work at the White House come before Congress to air their grievances. The other thing to note is the president has been attacking both of these individuals. He's been saying that they were never Trumpers, but both of them came and said, we are essentially apolitical. We are not here for one party or another. Instead, we're here out of a sense of duty. That's different than what President President Trump is saying. He also said that he thought Republicans did very well when it came to questioning these witnesses. So the president is pushing back on this narrative that Democrats really feel like they have in these two individuals, star witnesses, people who can really tell the story from a firsthand account. And for anyone who wasn't able to follow along with the day's proceedings, Lieutenant Colonel Vindman actually began the day by including much of his personal story in his opening statement. Nick Schifrin here with me. I want to ask you about this in a moment. We should point out Vindman was featured in a Ken Burns documentary at one point. His family story were was rather. Let's just take a listen uh, to part of that documentary, and then hear what Lieutenant Colonel Vindman had to say this morning. We came, came from, from Russia, Russia. And, and then we went to. Our mother died, so we went to Italy. And then we came here. When my father was 47 years old, he left behind his entire life and the only home he had ever known to start over in the, in the United States so his three sons could have a better and, sa and safer lives. His courageous decision inspired a deep sense of gratitude in my brothers and myself and instilled in us a sense of duty and service. All three of us have served or are currently serving in the military. My little brother sits behind me here today. I, our collective military service is a special part of our mil uh, family's history and uh, story in America. I also recognize that my simple act of appearing here today, just like the courage of my colleagues who have also truthfully testified before this committee, would not be tolerated in many places around the world. In Russia, my act of expressing concern to the chain of command in an official and private channel would have severe personal and professional repercussions, and offering public testimony involving the president would surely cost me my life. I'm grateful to my father's, for my father's brave act of hope 40 years ago and for the privilege of being an American citizen and public servant, where I can live free and free of fear for mine and my family's safety. Dad, I'm sitting here today in the U.S. Capitol talking to our elected professionals, talking to our elected professionals is proof that you made the right decision 40 years ago to leave the Soviet Union and come here to the United States of America in search of a better life for our family. Do not worry. I will be fine for telling the truth. Nick, it was an incredibly compelling moment, an incredibly compelling piece of testimony, really personal. Who is Lieutenant Colonel Vimino? What do we know about him? He and his brother, as we saw in that Ken Burns documentary, and the other brother, who we didn't see in the documentary, are Jewish immigrants from Ukraine, from the former Soviet Union. And the father that he mentions there came to the United States with $700 in cash and nothing else, and has seen his sons grow into members of the National Security Council staff. Currently, Vinman is Lieutenant Colonel, a foreign area officer 
in the army. It's basically the equivalent of an army diplomat, or the closest thing that the army has to diplomats. They have area expertise or country expertise. In Vindman's case, of course, it's Ukraine and Russia. These people are groomed to be defense attaches, groomed to serve in embassies. And Vindman has served in both Kyiv and Moscow. And that goes to some of the requirements for these foreign area officers, which is language. Uh, Vindman speaks both Ukrainian and Russian. And the military is proud to have these people. They find, the military finds that these people are incredibly important, the language, the area expertise, and they groom them to really be stars within the military. And Secretary Esper, the defense secretary, recently came out to defend Vindman. You know, there's some concern that Vindman would speak out uh, against the president. He used very specific language, very critical language of the president. Secretary Esper recently said that Vindman shouldn't have any fear of retaliation at all. So the military really defending him. And, and later uh, in, in his testimony, Vindman was asked, why are you willing to criticize the commander in chief, the most powerful man in the world? And why did you tell your dad not to worry? His simple answer, this is America. This is a place where I can speak out and even criticize the president. It's striking the secretary had to say he will be fine for testifying in this way, which brings me to Yamish back at the White House. You've got some additional reporting around this, Yamish. I'd love for you to share here other concerns about any fallout, any repercussions for Lieutenant Colonel Vindman for speaking as forcefully and clearly as he did today. Sources close to Lieutenant Colonel Vindman told me that an official, a high-ranking official from the Army, has actually called his family and reassured them that Lieutenant Colonel Vindman will not face any sort of retaliation. And that's important to note because Army Lieutenant Colonel Vindman is actually essentially deployed to the White House. This is an Army assignment for him. He's not someone who came and, and worked for the White House as a political appointee, but rather this is in some ways, um, this is in some ways his part of his um, service as an Army officer. And as a result, this is a sort of deployment to him. So when you think about that, it's the Army is feeling under so much pressure that they want to make sure they reach out to him and say, look, in your time where you think that you're doing what's best for your country, where you're putting yourself out there and testifying publicly, we want you to know that we have your back. That's incredibly important. I think it's also important that we to note that Vindman really put his his story as an immigrant, his family story as an American story at the center of his testimony today. And there are critics of the president who say this is a president who has had real issues when it comes to immigration, who's, who's in some ways people think challenged the very idea of America welcoming immigrants from all ports of the world. And now you have a lieutenant army colonel coming before Congress and saying, as this is my duty as an American to come forward and tell you that I have concerns with the president of the United States. I can't underscore enough how important that is and also how important it is that the army wanted to make sure that he knew that they that they that military um, service, that military agency has his back. That's that's incredibly important here. And you at the same time, it's worth noting that he took some tough questions from Republican members of Congress today. Uh, let's just play a quick exchange or show some of those questions that Lieutenant Colonel Vindman faced. I'd like to ask you about them on the back end. Lieutenant Colonel Vindman, I see you're wearing your dress uniform. Knowing that's not the uniform of the day, you normally wear a suit to the White House. I think it's a great reminder of your military service. I, too, come from a military family. These are my father's Air Force wings. He was a pilot in World War II. Five of his sons served in the military. So as one military family to another, thank you and your brothers for your service. Your example here. I, I, very quickly, I'm curious, when Ranking Member Nunez referred to you as Mr. Vindman, you quickly corrected him and wanted to be called Lieutenant Colonel Vindman. Do you always insist on civilians calling you by your rank? Uh, Mr. Stewart, um, Representative Stewart, I'm in uniform wearing my military rank. Uh, I just thought it was appropriate to uh, stick with that. Well, because, I, I, I'm I sorry, sure Mr. Stewart. No, I'm I sure you meant no disrespect. Because I, I, I don't believe he did, but um, the attacks that I've uh, had in the press um, in, uh, in Twitter have kind of eliminated the fact that either uh, marginalized me as a military officer well, uh, or... Listen, I, I just, I'm, just, I'm just telling you that the ranking member net met no disrespect to you. I, I believe that. I don't know him. Uh, I don't know, uh, as he says, Lieutenant Colonel, I understand somebody had the misfortune of calling him Mr. and he corrected them. Uh, I never saw the man. I understand now he wears his uniform when he goes in. No, I don't know Vindman at all. What I do know is that even he said that the transcript was correct. Yamish, that, of course, was President Trump when he was asked about Lieutenant Colonel Vindman in a cabinet meeting earlier today. What did you make of the way the president in the White House responded to his testimony? 
Well, the president was really trying to put some distance between him and Army Colonel Vindman, Army Lieutenant Colonel Vindman. But let's remember that the president has been lashing out at Vindman. He's been saying that he's a never Trumper. So he was really attacking his character. We saw the official White House Twitter account go after Vindman, quoting his superior, saying that he had concerns about his judgment. Though when Vindman was asked specifically about that, he said, actually, I have a evaluation from work that says that I'm actually a very good Army officer and that I actually have good remarks. But the White House didn't acknowledge that. Instead, the president went after him. And Republicans largely didn't go after Vindman's character today. But the president has been very consistent in the fact that he's been going after him. And I think what the president was doing today was essentially saying, look, I understand that he might be in the Army, but I also think that he was nitpicking a bit there. So you saw the president trying to, in some ways, walk a fine line by saying, I don't really know him. But in fact, the president has been tweeting over the last couple of days and even weeks that he is essentially very angry at Vindman and wanted to disparage his character. Lisa, take us back inside the hearing room now. Republicans spent a lot of time questioning Lieutenant Colonel Vindman. Talk to me about their strategy in the moment. What was it you think they were working towards in that line of questioning? I think Republicans know that Lieutenant Colonel Vindman feels strongly and that he uh, is, you know, has some very sincere beliefs there. But they wanted to question um, his credibility um, on a number of levels. And I think part of that was talking to one Republican lawmaker, thinking this might be a staffer who just went overboard in his theory. They raised questions about um, how his co-workers have seen him in the past. Lieutenant Colonel Vindman was ready for that. He brought, over, brought one of his own past evaluations. But I think for Democrats, they have always seen Vindman's testimony as some of the strongest. So it was important for Republicans to say, hey, wait a minute, not only is this someone that we're going to question his credibility, but they also question his function in the White House, bringing up that he, for example, has never personally met with the president. Vindman also countered that and said, yes, but I've prepared many documents for him. I am a core staffer to him. But, but Republicans, again, are trying to show this is not the direct link that Democrats say it is. That is part of the debate that they're having. Lisa, there was another particularly tense moment in the back and forth there and Republicans questioning of Lieutenant Colonel Vindman when it looked like they were getting towards the identity of the whistleblower. Mm -hmm. Chairman Schiff actually had to intervene at one point and, and try to straighten things out. Explain to us what happened in the moment and why it's important. That's exactly right. Lieutenant Colonel Vindman is thought by many to be a person who probably briefed the whistleblower. This is because we know the whistleblower from their own complaint was not actually on the original call, Presidents Zelensky and Trump, but instead heard about it from someone else. We know that um, Lieutenant Colonel Vindman did brief others, and the idea from Republicans is they say they want to know who the whistleblower is because they question whether the whistleblower is biased. Democrats say no, Republicans just want to out this person for political reasons. Whatever the rationale is, Republicans today were going down the road of asking Lieutenant Colonel Vindman who is it that you spoke to about this? Who did you brief? That is information to Democrats believe could reveal the whistleblower. Vindman says he himself does not know who the whistleblower is, but he didn't say whether he has suspicions of who it could be. He did say he's following guidance of the committee to not talk about this uh, as per Chairman Schiff's rules. That's something that Republicans object to. That, of course, was the testimony from this morning's panel. Nick, this afternoon, we saw two new witnesses, one of whom, Ambassador Kurt Volkel, rather, had uh, a few things to say about the Bidens and also about the Ukrainian company that Hunter Biden served on the board of, that is Burisma. Let's take a listen to what he had to say. There is a history of corruption in Ukraine. There's a history with the company of Burisma that's been investigated. Um, that is well known. Um, there is a separate allegation about the vice president acting inappropriately. His son was a board member of this company, but those things I saw as completely distinct. And what I was trying to do in working with the Ukrainians was to thread a needle to see whether things that they can do that are appropriate and reasonable as part of Ukraine's own policy of fighting corruption that help clarify for our president that they are committed to that very, that very effort. Uh, if there's a way to thread that needle, I, I thought it was uh, worth the effort to try to solve that problem. Uh, as it turns out, I now understand that uh, most of the other people didn't see or didn't consider this distinction, that for them it was synonymous.
Nick, we heard Ambassador Volker say that a few times, this threading the needle idea. What did you make of his testimony? This is the story of the failure of traditional diplomacy and the triumph of the irregular policy when it comes to Ukraine. So he tries to distinguish between Burisma and Biden. So let's do that for a second. Burisma, the largest energy company in Ukraine, notoriously corrupt. After 2014, when the Brits and the Americans moved into Ukraine and tried to help with corruption in Ukraine, the very first company that the Brits investigated was Burisma. And there was a Ukrainian investigation into Burisma that got stopped. And so that leaves us with Burisma. Joe Biden's son, Hunter Biden, was on the board of Burisma while the vice president was working on Ukraine policy. And we've, we've heard that a lot from Republicans. What Trump is, what Ambassador Volker is trying to say is that he thought that the Ukrainians should investigate Burisma and investigate the Ukrainians on Burisma. What the president was trying to do is investigate Burisma in order to investigate Hunter Biden and Joe Biden. It is the difference between the Trump administration policy of investigating corruption in Ukraine and President Trump's own policy when it comes to who to investigate in Ukraine in terms of corruption. And Volcker admitted today for the first time that he failed, that he said in hindsight he should have realized that other people weren't making the distinction and that for other people Burisma meant Biden because the single person that he failed to convince was President Trump. He finally admitted that President Trump did not make that distinguishing and that he should have and he would have done policy different. Of course, the story of why we're here is that that distinguishing point was never made for President Trump, and he didn't believe in it. Fascinating revelation to hear, of course. That was one piece of testimony from one witness. The other, Lisa, I want to ask you about was Tim Morrison. He was the former senior director for Russia and Europe on the National Security Council. Um, let's just take a listen to part of his testimony. On September 7th, you spoke again to Ambassador Sondland, who told you that he had just gotten off the phone with President Trump. Isn't that right? That, that sounds correct, yes. What did Ambassador Sondland tell you that President Trump said to him? Uh, if I recall this conversation correctly, this was where um, Ambassador Sondland related that um, there was no quid pro quo, but President Zelensky had to make the statement and that he had to want to do it. And by that point, did you understand that the statement related to the uh, Biden and 2016 investigations? I, th I think I did, yes. And that that was a, a essentially a condition for the security assistance to be released? I understood that that's what Ambassador Sondland believed. After speaking with President Trump? That's what he represented. Lisa, what did you make of that exchange? Yeah. That was a very important exchange. You're going to hear Democrats talk about that a lot. And you're going to hear a lot about it tomorrow when Mr. Sondland testifies. And what, what's happening here is Tim Morrison is recalling a conversation that Ambassador Sondland testified he, he did not recall. And it's an important conversation, uh, Sondland passing on basically th that this, there's a connection between the security assistance and the investigations after he spoke to the president. And Sondland, in his testimony, said he didn't recall that connection. In, he just has stressed the president said no quid pro quo. So that's important testimony from Mr. Morrison. You know, it, it has been a day of up and ups and downs for both sides, um, and, and I think we're going to get more of that tomorrow. You, okay. Mish, Lisa just mentioned we are going to hear from Ambassador Sondland tomorrow. Look ahead for us. What do we expect in day four of the public impeachment proceedings? Uh, the European ambassador, Ambassador Sondland, is going to be in some ways a star witness for both sides because both sides don't exactly know what they want to get out of him or what they might get out of him and how he might help their cases. But both of them desperately want to ask him questions because he was in direct contact with President Trump multiple times. Now, the White House has been telling me as well as our, produ our White House producer, Meredith Lee, that this is really all about, about, all about the Democrats wanting to overthrow the 2016 election, wanting to overturn the election results and wanting to really get President Trump out of office. But Ambassador Sondland is someone who was an ally of the president. He don donated more than a million dollars to President Trump's political campaign. He was then appointed ambassador to the European Union. So we have to really watch closely about how Ambassador Sondland answers some of these questions about what President Trump directly told him to say, because by his own admission, he said that he told Ukrainian officials, look, we need to get this investigation into the Bidens started in order for you to get that military aid, that $391 million in military aid. So tomorrow is going to be probably, if not one of the most important days, 
possibly the most important day because this is someone who can speak directly to what President Trump was telling him to do and how he was telling him to make the case to the Ukrainians. Another busy day on Capitol Hill. Thanks to you, Yamiche Alcindor at the White House, Lisa Desjardins on Capitol Hill, and Nick Schifrin here with me. The Judiciary Committee is ultimately responsible for deciding if impeachment charges will be brought against the president. And we turn now to two members of that committee. First up, Republican Congressman Mike Johnson of Louisiana. Congressman, thank you so much for being with me today. I wanted to ask you, over three days of testimony, has anything that you have heard or anything you have seen in any of the transcripts that have been released moved the needle for you on, on the decision to bring charges or not? It, it hasn't yet, and I can tell you that there's a, a high degree of frustration amongst members of the House Judiciary Committee. As, as you mentioned, we're the committee that has the appropriate jurisdiction over the impeachment proceeding, but that jurisdiction was effectively taken away from us and yielded to these other committees. To this day, even though I'm the ranking member of the Constitution Subcommittee and I serve on House Judiciary, I've not had the opportunity to review all of the evidence that's been gathered and the secret hearings they were having in the basement and everything we've heard so much about. What we've seen publicly and the transcripts that have been released, I think right now what we're having is an endless debate about individuals' opinions who didn't speak directly with the president, who have involved a lot of hearsay, and who are talking about a transcript that every single American has the option to read for themselves. No one has said the transcript is inaccurate. And to date, I just haven't seen anything that rises to the level of impeachable conduct. Well, Congressman, we will be hearing from some people who had direct contact and conversations with the president as the inquiry moves on. But I want to ask you about some testimony we heard today which was from Ambassador Kurt Volker. Uh, he is, of course, a witness called by your Republican colleagues on the committee, and he defended Vice President Biden. He said that he did not believe that he was corrupt in his dealings with Ukraine. What did you make of his testimony? Well, I didn't hear all of it, because some of us are still trying to work on Capitol Hill while they're doing all the rest of this. We had other committee hearings today and other things going on. I heard a, a snapshot, uh, a summary of what he said. And uh, look, his opinion, his personal opinion about Joe Biden is, is not really relevant to what's going on here today. I mean, I, that, that's interesting, but it doesn't have much to do with impeaching the president of the United States. The thing that concerns us is that this was is a predetermined political outcome. I think everybody can look at that and acknowledge it. There was a, there was a, a, a vote back in December of 2017 where 58 House Democrats went on record to say they wanted to begin impeaching the president. They, they changed the narrative many times since then until now. Now we're talking about a phone call uh, with, uh, with Zelensky. But th th there's been different reasons, different narratives, different theories. They're all trying to get to the same end, is that, and that is to get rid of Donald Trump. Th this should be a very serious thing to the American people. It's why the founders had impeachment listed as something that would be an exceedingly rare event. I, I think that what they're doing right now is frustrating the American people, and, and I think you're beginning to hear that out across the land. Well, let me ask you about something we, we did hear about, which was during the testimony of Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Vindman today. You and your, uh, your Republican colleagues on the Judiciary Committee have sent a letter to Chairman Nadler yesterday expressing concerns about his credibility, and it seemed like a good portion of Republicans' questioning of him today actually focused on that. Why spend so much time attacking the credibility of Lieutenant, Lieutenant Colonel Vindman? Uh, I, I don't know what, what the idea or the theory was behind the investment of time on that, but I, I do think the credibility of witnesses is important. That what, what Republicans are frustrated about is the lopsided nature of all of these hearings. We're not able to call all the witnesses that we want. We're not, as has been said so many times, allowed a proper cross-examination. Witnesses have been instructed uh, by, by Chairman Schiff not to answer certain questions, and that, that's problematic for us. So there's a lot, of, a lot of members are venting their frustration. They're trying to make sure that the rule of laws complied with here. And, uh, and I think that process and that procedure is, is really, really important. It's important to know where a witness is coming from, what their background is, and all of that. I, I, I'm personally fine with the credibility of this witness. It's not that is my chief concern. My concern is that he's talking about these, these notions and ideas, and he never spoke with the president himself. To date, the only person who's testified is Ambassador Sondland, who had a direct conversation with the president. And he said, he asked the president expressly, what do you want from Ukraine? 
nothing. And he said, I want nothing. I want no quid pro quo. I want them to do the right thing. That's pretty clear to me, and that's why the president has so much confidence in the transcript. And we'll hear from Ambassador Sondland tomorrow, I should point out. You spoke about potential witnesses, and I'd like to ask you about the president, who has said that he would strongly consider providing written answers to impeachment investigators. Would you recommend that he do that? Uh, look, I'm not his counsel. I used to be a lawyer, but I'm not anymore. I'm just a member of the House Judiciary Committee. I, look, the president is anxious, I think, to share the truth. He has been, in his view, doing that over and over. He released the transcript. He didn't have to do that. And he says uh, it's accurate, as does everyone else. So uh, if he wants to elaborate upon that, I mean, that's his choice. I, I, I know his frustration. I've spoken with him about it myself in recent days, and, and he shares that openly with others because he's really tired of the way this is all developed. And, and I don't blame him. What many have testified to, though, so far is that the president sought help from a foreign nation to investigate a domestic political rival. Does any part of that concern you? Look, the context is important. The, the real facts are still coming out. We don't know exactly uh, how that went down. But if the president was seeking to root out corruption, and it was a, an effort at anti-corruption to, to have Ukraine, who is listed on everyone's list as one of the most corrupt nations, uh, to get down to the bottom of this, to ensure that U.S. taxpayer dollars are not misspent overseas, I think that's a commendable thing. I think he has a fiduciary obligation as the commander-in-chief of this nation to do nothing less than that. And, and I think that's why a lot of the American people applaud it. Congressman Mike Johnson, the Republican from Louisiana, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Appreciate it. And now we get a view from the other side of the aisle and the majority on the Judiciary Committee. Representative Pramila Jayapal, a Democrat from the state of Washington. Congresswoman, welcome back to the News Hour and thank you for making the time today. I want to ask you about what several witnesses have testified to. The words they've used so far have been improper or inappropriate in with regards to the president's behavior or interaction, specifically on that July 25th call. There is a difference between those words and impeachable. Have you seen anything so far that rises to the level of an impeachable offense? Well, I think what really stuns me is that my Republican colleagues would think that a president's actions bribing a foreign government to interfere in our elections by digging up dirt on a, uh, on a political rival and withholding aid that Congress appropriated, that's taxpayer money, by the way, that Congress appropriated to Ukraine. I just can't believe that my Republican colleagues are arguing that that is not a high crime and misdemeanor. I mean, bribery is clearly laid out, but it is disturbing to me to see the lengths to which the Republicans are standing up for this president and putting party over country. That That is uh, really difficult for me to understand as somebody that swore an oath to uphold and defend the Constitution, as did my Republican colleagues. I am, uh, I think it's a sad day that they can listen to all of this testimony, which pro provides corroborating evidence over and over and over again from people who were directly on that call with President Trump. That's what we heard today. But uh, again, over and over, evidence that shows that the president has betrayed national security and violated our Constitution. Congresswoman, you mentioned the word bribery. Speaker Pelosi last week had said, quote, the devastating testimony corroborated evidence of bribery uncovered in the inquiry. Is it a bribery charge with which you plan to move forward? Well, we don't know exactly what the charges will be. As you know, I'm on the Judiciary Committee. Our role now is to wait and get the reports from the different committees. We will have due process. We will have the president's counsel will be able to testify if he wants to do so. Um, and then we will look at all of that on the Judiciary Committee, and we will decide if we are going forward with impeachment articles, um, and we will then look at what those articles will be. I will just tell you that the evidence is damning, but the thing that is most damning is the testimony from the earliest witness, the first witness to testify to the American people, and that was Donald Trump, who he himself said, this is what I did. I withheld aid. I uh, went and asked for an investigation, a public investigation from a very fragile country. Let's not forget the situation that Ukraine is in and what this actually does to our leadership role in, uh, in the world when you have the most powerful country essentially saying, 
I'm not going to give you the aid you need, much less the meeting at the White House, unless you agree to investigate my political rival. That should be untenable for every Democrat and every Republican. Congressman, let me ask you about something else. Now, the House is investigating whether or not President Trump lied to special counsel Robert Mueller during the Russia investigation. Could what is uncovered in that probe eventually become part of the impeachment proceedings as well? Everything is on the table, is what I would say to that. Um, we are, you know, trying to uh, make sure we get all the facts that we need. At the same time, um, we understand that speed is of the essence, and we are going to take the things that are most unfolding in front of us. Now, there is evidence that was presented to us by Robert Mueller. Um, in fact, I questioned Robert Mueller directly on the charges within the Mueller report of witness intimidation and witness tampering. Let's not forget that these things that we're seeing in Ukraine are part of a pattern, continual pattern of the president acting in a certain way. Certainly, witness intimidation, um, lying, obstruction of Congress, obstruction of justice, these are all patterns of this president. But let me ask you about, by, by broadening that, by saying everything is on the table, do you worry it plays into the accusation that this is a witch hunt, that you'll, you'll just do whatever you can to bring a charge eventually? No, I mean, when I say everything is on the table, I'm saying we haven't prejudged any outcomes here. What is important is the facts and the truth. That is what these witnesses have been about. We are waiting in judiciary to get the information from the committees. We will have due process. Um, but I just have to tell you that the, and, and I will say that I think the ultimate uh, articles, should there be any, will be narrow and targeted because we understand that this is about the Constitution, one thing and one thing only. It's not about whether we like the president's policies. It's not about whether we, you know, we agree with him or disagree with him. It is about the Constitution and whether he has betrayed the Constitution. And so that is what um, it, we will be focusing on. Congressman, you've promised due process. You've always said, you've also said that time is of the essence. So you've got two more days of public hearings this week, five more witnesses. Then what? What is the timeline moving forward? When do you hope that these proceedings will be wrapped up? Well, I think that the, the timeline is as it unfolds. I know that's not a very satisfactory answer, but I do think that we on the Judiciary Committee want to be sure that we are getting the full information from the Intel Committee um, and from the other committees of jurisdiction. So we will wait for them to wrap it up. I will say that there's nothing... Um, what is so compelling about the, these witnesses is how incredibly credible they are. I mean, a, a decorated uh, Purple Heart... Um, Lieutenant Colonel that testified today, Vindman, you know, dedicated career servants who have testified. And so they are adding color and they are corroborating the story. But I will say that the facts are still the facts and they haven't really changed substantially except for the corroboration. So I think there will be a point at which Adam Schiff says, I think we've got what we need um, and, you know, it tells the complete story and now we're going to send this over to judiciary. Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal, a Democrat from Washington, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. And our live impeachment hearing coverage continues tomorrow and Thursday. That's starting at 9 a.m. Eastern, 8 o'clock Central. Check your local TV listings and also find us streaming online on Facebook, Twitter, and on our YouTube pages. Good evening from NewsHour West. I'm Stephanie Sai. We'll return to Amna Nawaz with the rest of the program right after the latest headlines. Israel carried out what it called a counterattack in Syria early Wednesday. The Israeli military said it struck dozens of Iranian and Syrian military targets in response to rocket fire. Syria's state news agency said the country's air defenses destroyed most of the incoming missiles over Damascus and also reported three injuries. The U.S. Senate has unanimously passed legislation supporting the pro-democracy protests in Hong Kong. Responding quickly, China's foreign ministry said the U.S. should stop interfering in its affairs. Today, a handful of protesters remained holed up at a university besieged by police. Last night, some tried to escape down roads, ropes. Others walked out wearing masks and emergency blankets. Hours later, some wrote an SOS on the ground in a plea for help. Police have already arrested more than 1,000 people since the siege began on Sunday. 
Multiple news reports say that a Navy SEAL who has received support from President Trump may be ousted from the elite commando force. Rear Admiral Colin Green is ordering a review board to look at the case of Chief Petty Officer Edward Gallagher. Just last week, President Trump restored Gallagher's rank. A military jury acquitted him of murder last summer but convicted him of a lesser charge. Governor Gavin Newsom took two steps today to restrict oil and gas exploration in California. He announced the state will not approve new fracking projects until permits are reviewed by an independent panel of scientists. He also issued a moratorium against a similar process used for drilling oil. The oil industry voiced criticism, saying the actions will only lead to more foreign oil imports from places with lesser environmental safety standards. Several thousand public school teachers in Indiana surrounded the state capitol building today. The educators, all in red, demanded a hike in pay and an end to using student test scores to evaluate teachers in schools. The scale of the protests forced nearly half of Indiana's school districts to close for the day. The U.S. House of Representatives has approved a short-term spending bill to prevent a government shutdown. It would keep federal agencies running through December 20th, buying more time to work out a final spending package. The Senate is on track to pass it, and President Trump has indicated he will sign it. Amnesty International says that more than 100 people protesting a fuel price hike in Iran have been killed in a crackdown. Today, state TV showed empty streets with burned out mosques and vandalized bank machines. An internet blackout remained in force. A United Nations spokesman called for Tehran to explain itself. It would be very useful to have a better, clearer picture, but it's clearly very significant, very... <clears throat> um, alarming situation and, and widespread across the country. We would encourage states to, uh, to maintain um, the flow of information. If there's false information, they can rebut it, but uh, let, let's see the information. But so far, the Iranian government has not given any public accounting of the death toll. Thousands of Lebanese protesters converged in central Beirut today, preventing parliament from meeting. They blocked roads and chased SUVs trying to bring one lawmaker to the government buildings. Scuffles broke out with riot police who tried to disperse the crowds. Protesters were outraged that legislators intended to meet without discussing demands for reforms. In Afghanistan, the Taliban today freed two Western hostages who had been held since 2016. American Kevin King and Australian Timothy Weeks were teachers at the American University in Kabul when they were kidnapped. Their release came after the Afghan government released three top Taliban commanders. More than 100 fires burned across Australia's east coast today, engulfing Sydney in smoke. The heavy haze prompted health warnings for some 5 million people. Air quality was 10 times the hazardous level, caused by atmospheric conditions that held the smoke in place. We've got this real mix of, of converging winds today, and, and you can see the, 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 the smoke impact into the Sydney Basin, for example, today. That's because we've got quite a northerly influence uh, influencing down the, the coast of New South Wales and across the inland. Strong winds and drought conditions have stoked wildfires across eastern Australia this month, destroying more than 300 homes. This is the PBS NewsHour from WETA Studios in Washington and in the West from the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism at Arizona State University. Last week, the FBI reported that hate crime violence in the country is at a 16-year high. In 2018, there were more than 4,500 such crimes, assaults that were motivated in part or in whole by racial, ethnic, or religious bias, as well as discrimination against gender and sexual orientation. The U.S. Commission on Civil Rights also reported that the highest percentage of all reported hate incidents since the 2016 election were in elementary and secondary schools. NewsHour special correspondent Charlene hunter -Galt looks at how this problem has played out in Northwest Oregon and how teachers are learning to intervene earlier. It's part of our education coverage, Making the Grade, and the latest in our Race Matters series looking at solutions to racism. A warning, this story contains some offensive and troubling images. 
At schools just like South Ridge High near Portland, Oregon, educators say white nationalists are making inroads, but also infiltrating nationwide from online. They're co-opting otherwise innocent images like helicopters, cartoon frogs, and the OK sign, incorporating them widely into racist images and videos. And they're showing up alongside more familiar hate symbols in unlikely places. KCALINE Orange County reporter Stacey Butler is live tonight in Newport Beach with that story. A swastika made out of red solo cups at a high school party in California. A parent Nazi salutes in a prom photo in Wisconsin. The OK sign, which some use as a hand sign for white power, flashed in high school yearbooks at schools near Chicago, forcing costly reprints. Okay. It's not specifically alt-right, it just can be used in that way, but it can also be used in many other ways. Southridge High School senior Tristan Madron says many young people are sucked in with dark humor. People treat it almost in a joking manner, like, like um, I don't know, black people are ruining the country, you know, stuff like that. I've, I've seen new iterations of the N-word. They're treating it like, haha, this is a funny joke. What if we drag someone by a car across the street? Online forums can often pull students in deeper. One student who didn't want to be identified told us that a friend even communicated with the Christchurch New Zealand shooter before he murdered 51 people, the student thinking it was all a joke. It was in between the first and second shootings, but he didn't know that this was happening. And he was like, the second shootings commenced or whatever, like blah, blah, blah. And then he heard about it and he was like, wait, like, <laughs> that was like real? That was, you know, Something he was telling all of us. At South Ridge itself, students recently spray painted the football field with swastikas. School officials investigated but never found the culprits, and some students were left feeling uneasy. It's like I'm Jewish and I'm also black, so seeing that kind of stuff and knowing that I go to the school, I go to school with these people who don't like a part of me scares me. You're the target oftentimes. You're the target demographic when people want to change the future. That's Patrick Griffin, a Southridge social studies teacher who started looking for ways to fight back when offensive stereotypes made their way into his own classroom. He soon found a toolkit online called Confronting White Nationalism in Schools, written in part by Lindsay Schubiner of the nonprofit Western States Center. There have been over 5,000 requests for the toolkit from educators around the world. Patrick Griffin and Lindsay Schubiner, thank you so much for joining us. And I want to start with you, Patrick. Can you tell me what was it that initially set off an alarm bell for you when you heard things that were th frightening or threatening or? Um, for me, I guess it comes in several parts. All of these instances of, of violence housed in an ideology of white nationalism, I see it affecting my kids and they're talking about it, and some of them are scared about it, and some of them are scared about talking about it. Like what, for example? So we might be having conversations about um, nationalism in my class, and so we would be having these conversations, and these conversations were happening within the current political climate, and so inherently we'd start talking about current events and start talking about uh, the most recent presidential election and whatnot, um, and I'd have some students who, whose faces would fall and whose eyes would, would disengage. Other, on the other hand, I've got other students who are feeling safe to engage with the conversation in a healthy way. I've also had students who are feeling safe to engage in the conversation in some unhealthy ways because they were really happy about the growing movements of taking uh, America back to a very white place. And so I put the word out, hey, does anybody have any resources that I could use? And that's how I came across the toolkit. Well, Lindsay, this is where you come in. There does seem to be, by all accounts, a rise in uh, white supremacist speech. How is it that you came to deal with that? And how did you, what did you come up with? We know that white nationalists and alt-right movements are intentionally recruiting young people. Uh, the editor of a neo-Nazi website has written that he, he designs his website to recruit children as young as 11 years old. We're talking about young people who are 
who don't yet have fully formed views and opinions about the world. And that's a big reason why white nationalists and alt-right groups are working to recruit them. So you've come up with this kit, a kit that you've used in your classes. What does this kit do? So this toolkit provides some context and some guidance around the issue of white nationalist and alt-right recruitment of young people. And it also provides a number of scenarios, possible things that might happen in a school community. It also contains definitions and a roadmap to alt-right symbols to help teachers, administrators, and community members strip the secrecy from white nationalism. So how have you used the toolkit? So uh, I like using the toolkit in my classrooms with my lesson plans, whether it be talking about definitions or scenarios. Uh, the toolkit has been useful in, in heck, conversations in the, in the hallways with students as they're coming up to me to talk about, hey, Mr. Griffin, what do you think about this or that meme or whatnot or what, whatever is current in their life? Uh, we're also using the toolkit uh, to create advisory lesson plans that the entire school body, student body, will be using. One thing the toolkit tries to do is empower students that they do have a voice, but it's not their responsibility to take this on. There are adults in the, in the community, and it's, it's our job to take this on. And do your students, the students that you're talking with, do they understand, especially those who are embracing these white nationalist tropes, how do you deal with them and prevent them from moving into the direction of violence. If, if a kid is going through that, then you've got to make them feel known, valued, loved, part of the community, because so much of this is this isolationism that they're experiencing, while also educating some of their ignorance about the greater context of it. How, reaching the students in your classroom doesn't address what they're getting at home, so how do you deal with that? For people who are already deeply involved in white nationalism, uh, this toolkit is not for them. But it also, we hope, will help create communities that are openly talking about issues of white, white nationalism, white supremacy, racial justice, and reinforcing values that, uh, that include everyone. To both of you, how hopeful are you that the kind of extremism that this toolkit is trying to address can be contained or even defeated. How, are you hopeful at all? Or is it just moving too fast? I, I have a lot of reasons to not be hopeful, I guess. That said, I have a lot of reasons to be hopeful too. And it is um, that these kids are willing to engage in these conversations in a nuanced manner that I don't think some previous generations have been as willing to engage in. And so if, if you just keep doing that, eventually you get an entire new generation in charge, and, and I, I suppose there's a lot of hope there. Well, let's hope that's where hope lies. Yeah, right. Let's hope for the hope. Yeah, <laughs> sometimes that's all you got. <laughs> well, Patrick Griffin and Lindsay Schubiner, thank you so much for joining us, and all the best with your work in the future. Thank you. Thank you. And before we go tonight, a story that is all the buzz. Detroit is known for the rhythms of Motown and the hum of automobile plants. One nonprofit is adding a new sound to the urban landscape, buzzing bees. Special correspondent Mary Ellen Geist reports. Detroit is buzzing thanks to Timothy Paul Jackson and Nicole Lindsay. Jackson and Lindsay are the founders of Detroit Hives, a nonprofit organization that is transforming Detroit's vacant spaces. I saw a, a, an announcement where the city of Detroit is looking for residents and nonprofit organizations to take back some of these vacant lots. They considered several options, including a peacock farm and an urban campsite. But a health issue led Jackson to discover the medicinal properties of honey, and that sparked his curiosity about beekeeping. Nicole began to see my interest, and she made a very simple suggestion. She said, how about we transform a vacant lot into a bee farm? When you think about bees, they definitely don't go hand in hand with um, the urban environment. Detroit's 75,000 vacant lots can be problematic for humans, but they're a paradise for bees. 
Where there were once homes, factories, and buildings, there are now community gardens, urban farms, and flowering plants, the perfect place for bees to gather the pollen they need to make honey. When we think about developing our areas or our communities, we don't include nature. But since Detroit has so many vacant lots, and it seems like it's becoming like this rural, urban type of city, we can incorporate nature type things in our city and they can actually thrive. Lindsay and Jackson are working to revitalize 45 vacant lots in the next five years and expand to 200 hives, making the land beneficial to Detroit's inner city residents by increasing food security. A lot of times in our communities, we don't have access to fresh organic food. Whenever you have hives near a community garden, you're guaranteed to see an increase in your yield. And that's why we partner with community gardens to help provide food security. Lindsay and Jackson are also dedicated to using bees to teach conservation and sustainability to young children. It gives us the opportunity to now teach our youth about nature and actually telling them like, hey, you should actually grow um, gardens in your yard and tell your parents not to spray chemicals so we can see more of this thriving. I believe we measure our impact by education. To be able to give back is what it's all about. And it's about keeping Detroit buzzing about its future. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm Mary Ellen Geist in Detroit, Michigan. That is a sweet way to end the show. And yes, that is a bad honey pun. That is the news hour for tonight. I'm Amna Nawaz. Join us online and again here tomorrow for special live coverage of the impeachment hearings with perhaps one of the most significant witnesses yet. That's U.S. Ambassador to the EU, Gordon Sondland. Tune in starting at 9 a.m. Eastern. For all of us here at the PBS NewsHour, thank you, and we'll see you soon. Major funding for the PBS NewsHour has been provided by BNSF Railway, Consumer Cellular, the Ford Foundation, working with visionaries on the front lines of social change worldwide, Carnegie Corporation of New York, supporting innovations in education, democratic engagement, and the advancement of international peace and security at Carnegie.org. And with the ongoing support of these individuals and institutions. This program was made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. This is PBS News Hour West. From WETA Studios in Washington and from our bureau at the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism at Arizona State University. PBS.